While there are many ways to get sober, there is only one way to stay sober, joyous, and free. I was one of those struggling recoveries who would have immediately smacked that statement right in the face. I just didn't realize at the time how much I was struggling and what I was struggling with. Getting sober is the easy part, and there are many ways to do so. Some lock themselves in a room for a few days. Some sleep it off. You could visit a farm far, far away. Jail does it for some. Inpatient treatment, county detox, or hospital. Just white-knuckle it and keep going to work a lot, and so on. But as we all know, as time goes on, you can still get drugs in any of these places when you want. Getting sober is different than staying sober, and being sober for an extended period of time, while living life in a joyous and free way, is even more different. This has to do with the relationship we have with the behavior itself. In the last course, I went over the social-environmental obsession aspect, the tribal herd mentality or instinct. But the relationships we have with our behaviors are more personal and intimate. Humans are such social creatures we develop relationships with everything. We're just always interacting and loving or hating all the aspects of everything. Our cars, we name them and talk to them. Our tools, tech, inanimate objects, we develop some level of relationship. Even our jobs, we don't say, I hate going to work, I hate working. We say, I hate my job. It's personal. We personalize, or I should say, personify everything. And that's simply because we reflect what we are onto everything else. We are a person with a personality and identity. Identifying and labeling everything else and attributing characteristics to it. Businesses need a face, a talking head their customers can interact with. You get the picture. Basic stuff. While in early recovery, one of the addict's biggest fears is that someday something will work and they will be sentenced to life without their toxic lover. This is similar to the concept that we can hate the government all we want, but if it were to go away, our life would change dramatically, and many fear what that would be like. We can hate it, and realize it does so many horrible toxic things, but then again, if it were to disappear, its enticements, conveniences, and benefits go bye-bye as well. And how scary would life be then? Fear over the absence of an omniscient entity, one we can't really touch and that seems to be everywhere, and that we know is lying, killing, manipulating, stealing, and so on. Just an example. I'm going to start this one off with why an addict in early recovery needs to stay clear of socializing where their drugs are being used. There's this thing where an addict gets out of treatment with the confidence of a couple weeks of sobriety and armed with these little coping strategies, and they are encouraged to try and participate in all things worldly once again. Their partners, co-workers, family, and friends all say things like, you need to learn to be around it at some point. Go on, practice your new coping skills. But what was rarely discussed or given admission by the recovery was that an addict in recovery had a relationship with their drug use, and that this relationship was the best lover they ever had, by a long shot. Side note, I know it was discussed in treatment and probably had an assignment attached to it, but not like this. It was a relationship. No different than a relationship with a woman or a man, our ride or die. It was there for us no matter what. We could always rely on it to make us feel better after a hard day. It relaxed every fiber in our body like a good foot rub. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired, it was there. Scared? It was our guardian. Couldn't sleep? It was there. Anxious? It was there. Pain? It was there. Inferiority complex? It was there to boast confidence. Accomplishments? It was there to celebrate and reward us. When life got rough, it was there. It was always down a party. We brought it with us everywhere, weddings, ate dinner with it, spent tons of money on it, and had sex with it in our system. Always dependable, when it was there, but now it's gone. No matter how much we loved it, or still do, 
The relationship got so toxic and abusive, we knew we needed to leave. We needed to break up. It is now our ex. Keep this in mind for the early recovery stage. How long is early recovery? How long does it take to get over an ex who you were madly in love with for years and years? Every week, every day, this relationship ran strong. How long would it take to get over it? Early recovery is the first one to three years. But guess what happens in early recovery? We get invited to things. We get invited to parties and events. Do we think we might see our ex there? Even though the ex is this crazy ass toxic hot mess, you still kind of want to see them. You still kind of miss them in early recovery. As much as you hate them, you still love them. So let me tell you why you can't be around your ex until you've locked in tight what I have spoken on thus far and built some resiliency. Because I don't care how tough you look or how much you say you don't love them hoes, this one got you. Something happens when you go places where you know you'll see your ex. There's a term used these days for a sick trend in pornography called cucking. For those of you who don't know what this word means, it's a situation where a person is humiliated, dominated, or made to feel inferior in a romantic or sexual relationship. That's the nice version. It's when your significant other is cheating right in front of you, having sex with another person while you unwillingly watch. For example, if you are an alcoholic and go to where you will see your ex, like a wedding reception with an open bar or a club or poker night, not only will you see someone else strutting around with your ex like a date, but you will also see all those people getting off on the best lover you ever had, having a good old time, passing her around, hands all over her, putting their lips on her, laughing with her, sharing her, dancing with her, getting their fill and satisfaction. A bunch of people in the room are indulging in your ex. It is the subconscious equivalent to watching someone you are in love with getting gangbanged. If sober, you can't even join in. All you can do is sit there and watch and pretend you are having a good time. You can't even tell them to stop. All you can do is leave, go home, and then think about it. But this ex is different. Unlike a human ex who doesn't want you back, this ex will take you back at any time. Just a phone call or a trip to the store away. Morbid, crude, and vulgar, I know, but that is what's happening. How long does it take to get over someone you love? Just because you broke up doesn't mean you don't still love them. How long is early recovery? Early recovery is the first one to three years. So, what's the best way to get over an ex? When do you no longer care who they're banging and how much of a toxic slut they really are? You get a new love, right? Everyone knows the best way to get over an ex is to replace that relationship with a new one, a better one. The best way to get over an ex is to replace your ex with a new love, and the recovering addict will try to replace it one way or another, whether it be with another drug, work, food, exercise, getting a degree, or whatever they think might replace it, or to keep them from thinking about and missing their ex. Some call all this busyness structure. Some replacements are healthier than others. However, what most find out is the replacement isn't as good as their ex, and they start missing their past love and want to call them back again. The trick here is you must replace it with a better love. Joining a gym won't do everything the drug did for you. Going to meetings won't replace it either. Meetings are for an hour a day at best. Your drug was always there. You can throw every healthy thing you can think of into your routine, and the best you'll get is six-pack abs, a pat on the back, and most likely burn out and want your ex back anyways. But, of course, this time you will tell your ex you've changed. Things are different now. I've got my shit together. I'm a new man. No worldly relationship will replace the relationship you had with your drug because your drug use did not originate in the world. It originated in sin. Your relationship was with Satan, whether you knew it, know it, believe it, or not. Satan's artillery? Pride, greed, wrath, envy, lust, gluttony, and sloth. 
all of these are attractive, seductive, and make you feel awesome at first. Just like a drug. These are the roots of all disease and discord. It can all be traced back to these seven persuasions. It can all be boiled down to one or more of the seven deadly sins. Whether it's with an individual or a societal norm, both influence each other. Individual sin and collective population sin influence each other. Your sin adds to the collective sin, and the collective sin is why you see innocent people suffering. The addict will notice this after abstaining from the drug for a while. They will struggle with one or more of these sins. In 12-step programs, they call them character defects. After you have kicked your addiction's ass, you will find you have some character defects because you were born into sin and why we need to be reborn. Now, if you can better understand the true toxic relationship you were in, who do you think should replace this relationship? God. You replace it with God. God grants you freedom. The devil does not. That's why you can't stay joyous and free of sin on your own. Most just find themselves shuffling their sins around in a never-ending loop, which is exactly what we need to be saved from. The freedom I'm referring to is not the freedom to do whatever you want. Humans want sin. Look around. It's freedom from the ropes of sin. The freedom to choose, but there are only two choices. Who gets your soul? That's what you get to choose. So let's say someone does want to replace the sinful relationship they had been entertaining with the devil with God. How does one go about doing that? You do it like you did your drug. Your new dealer to score some G-O-D is Jesus. Through his teachings, his way, is how you get God all up in your life. Now wait, I am not talking about religion here. I am talking about a relationship with the primary God, because there are many smaller gods. And the best way I have found to learn how to be around God is through the teachings of the Christ which is what crosses one over to a new jurisdiction and operation. Hell into heaven. You treat your new relationship much like your ex. Wake up to him in the morning, look forward to your time with him, trust that he will provide what you truly need. Have you ever felt better just knowing your drug was on its way? Do the same with God. Hang around others who have the same relationships. Go to events with him present. Places where he is welcome and invited. Spend money on him. We don't care where our money ends up when we buy clothes or any other products. Why would we care when we bring God his money? Invite him to meals. Share him with others when you have more than enough. And just like your ex, you can pretend at first you are using it. But in the end, let it use you. Put in half the effort you once did with indulgences and you'll be just fine. Have you ever stayed up late praying? Lost sleep praying? Woke up early to pray? I'm not going to start Bible thumping. I have said everything I need to about why this is the only way to stay sober, joyous, and free. I wasn't always a believer, a follower of the teachings of Christ. And if there was any other label I could put on it, I would. But his teachings are unique, so I have to. Actually, I missed the joyous part. How do I prove that? How can I sell the concept that life is better on the other side? I can't. I can't describe to you what it's like outside of the catacombs of hell. There is no story I can convince you with, and you probably wouldn't believe me anyways. It's different for everyone. It's hard enough to convince you of where you really are. The devil is so good at lying, he's got you thinking those ideas talking to you in your mind are yours, that you came up with them, that it sounds just like you. Does it? Just so you know, do as you wish, do as thou wilt, is the motto straight from the church of Satan. You want to blame God for your problems when you have been serving an entirely different master. That's like me going to your job in a hospital and blaming your boss for shit my boss is doing at my job on a construction site. Even the 12 steps, which is based on Christianity, had to... Remove biblical God because of that mindset. Here's how bad it is. This is how ironic it has become. I currently attend a Christ-based 
12-step group called Celebrate Recovery, a Christ-centered and Bible-based 12-step recovery program. How messed up is that? The biggest argument for the bashing of this good God is that if he is so good, why did he allow Satan's hell? To give you a choice. If the opposition wasn't there, you would be forced to be good and all obedient to him. You get to choose. Nothing I say can drag you out of a place you might think you belong to, but I just stood you right at the door, and I am telling you, it's not locked. 1 Peter 2.11 Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Sometimes you need to believe it to see it.